Welcome to Morningstar Christian Chapel YouTube channel. Please remember to hit that subscribe button, like button, and the notification bell so you can find out when we go live or post a new video. And be sure to leave a comment about what God has shown you in this message. Thanks, and enjoy the study. All right, let's open our Bibles this morning to the Gospel of Luke chapter 21, verse 5. Luke 21, 5. The words from Jesus that we're going to begin this morning really take up the rest of chapter 21. They are found in much greater detail in Mark chapter 13 and in even greater detail in Matthew 24 and 25. So if you're feeling like you're, something's left out, go read those along with our portion here in Luke. Luke is interested in only covering the pieces that fit into his purpose for writing. And one of his great uh, emphases is that Jesus' return in his first and second coming, there'll be a great deal of time in between. And the Lord's first coming was to die, not to rule, but to set up his kingdom in our hearts. So this is a little bit of the Reader's Digest version in the sense that this is what the Lord gave Luke to write down. In verse 5, we read, Then as some of the, uh, someone spoke of the temple, how it was adorned with great stones and donations, and Jesus said, These things which you see, the days will be or come, in which not one stone will be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. His comment as they left the temple area caused the disciples to just begin to question, what in the world is he talking about? And what we are given, not so much this morning, although it'll, it'll find its way into some of the verses, but especially the next couple of weeks as we finish this chapter, is that prophecy always has kind of a dual fulfillment. There is the declaration of something that is near, and then it is obviously that foreshadowing of what is yet to come. It's like the lamb, you know, that was killed at Passover would become the Lord. It's, it's a, a picture, a portrait of what is yet to come. And a lot of um, prophecy is like that as well. And like I said, beginning in verse 20, we'll see it a lot more. Um, but I want you to understand the context in which this is given. There is a lot of disparity among Bible commentators as to application and most of the application that comes out of this chapter, out of Mark 13 or out of Matthew 24 and 25, have to do with chronology. When does it fit in? And because there is a near-term application that is certainly already fulfilled, there is also a projection, ultimately, of what is to come. And much of that is found in the book of Revelation during the Great Tribulation time as God again begins to deal with national Israel. And so it's good that you would know uh, the book of Revelations well or have studied it. But there are always those things that you just kind of have to leave with the Lord. Chesterton, who was a, a pretty interesting Bible commentator years ago, said it's a fool to stick your head into heaven and think you know it all, your head will burst. He said it's better to just stick your head into heaven and look around. And so sometimes you just have to go, I don't know, Lord, you'll have to show me when these things take place. But here's where we are. Jesus had showed up in Jerusalem, at, actually in Bethany, sometime either before the Passover started or after it had ended, if you will. We find him on Saturday at the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They have a dinner there. Lazarus, who had been raised from the dead, is there. A lot of people are gathering to see him. Mary takes out a very expensive bottle of perfume and anoints the Lord. It angers Judas, who holds the money and thought, gosh, I could take some of that. He would eventually go out and make a deal for Jesus so probably on Wednesday or so. On Sunday, there was that triumphal entry into the city, or actually towards the city. The Lord stops on that Palm Sunday road, weeps over the city, over the consequences of them rejecting him, though he had come for them, and how he would have liked to gather them, but they would not, and what their unbelief and their future suffering will come as a result. He, he curses a tree, on Monday, on his way back into town, a fig tree, that, and, and speaks about the, the difficulties that the nation of Israel is going to face for their setting him aside, cleanses the temple on Monday, and then really much of the Gospels is, is uh, 
preoccupied with Tuesday. Tuesday of Passion Week as Jesus spends all day there in the temple, ministering to the crowds, entertaining a whole bunch of different groups of religious groups who wanted to take him out, answering their questions, putting them kind of on the defensive. <clears throat> Finally, <clears throat> speaking to the people and then speaking to the scribes about uh, what does the Bible teach and try to even pull out some scriptures that out of Psalm 110 that they should have known very well. But rather than listening to the logic and the, the teaching, they, they turned away quietly. And so the Lord ended by saying, you know, be careful of these guys. They, they have a religious appearance, but they have no relationship with God at all. And you can read the, 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 the words from the Lord in Matthew 23 to the scribes and the Pharisees. It's, it's in much greater detail there. Uh, last week, we ended with the, the, the nicest thing that happened that day. Jesus watched a widow throwing in two mites into a, in a, into a collection area there in the court of the women, and he was so blessed to see her devotion to him. So that's it for Tuesday. The Lord is now leaving the temple area for good. He won't really come back here except to be placed on trial and led down the streets of Jerusalem to Golgotha. But this is, like I said, nearing sunset on Tuesday. And he heads back to the Mount of Olives. You go out the temple uh, gates, if you will. You go down the Kidron Valley, up on the other side, under the Mount of Olives. It's about a, a mile or so, if you will, back up to that area, if you will. It's a pretty good walk, lots of downhill and uphill across the, the Kidron Brook. And, and after Jesus said what we read here in verse 6, nobody said a word to him. They just kind of walked along silently, wondering what the Lord meant by that. So, uh, leaving the temple for good, not to return. I suspect maybe the disciples sensed uh, his frustration, his sadness over the response from those that he loved. Uh, we are not told who eventually spoke up and, uh, and said to him, Hey, look at the temple. In fact, we read in Mark 13, Matthew 24, as they were leaving, that the disciples said, look how beautiful the temple is. Like, cheer up, Lord, look how, we're doing good. In fact, it says in Mark that one of the disciples said, teacher, <laughs> look how beautiful the stones are. Look how magnificent the building is. And it is to that comment that Jesus responds here in verse 6. <clears throat> so, I don't know who spoke up to encourage him. There were four disciples. I know that because Mark 13 says so, who will sit with him a mile away on some stones looking over the temple on a Tuesday night. And they will begin to ask him questions. But the whole discussion started by Jesus, you know, looking discouraged, I think, and the boys trying to encourage him with the temple and the Lord saying, well, yeah, this isn't going to last. This is not going to last. I guess Peter is the one who spoke up. That's my guess. But when we get there, we'll find out if I was right or not. In Mar Matthew chapter, sorry, is, is it Matthew? Yeah, Mark chapter 13, verse 1. Um, he's told about the beautiful um, stones. <laughs> and, and that's really no hype. Perbly. It's not a it's not a hype. These guys are not trying to say something that isn't there. The the temple in Jesus' day was considered one of the ancient wonders of the Roman world. Renovation had started 46 years earlier under Herod the Great. And this guy knew how to build. You can read about that in John, I think, chapter two. And it wasn't going to be completed for another 13 years or so. So it'll be 46 or 47 A.D. before it was finished, just in time for it, for it to be destroyed in 70 A.D. It lasted 23 years. If, if you go to Israel today, where the temple once stood, you know, the Temple Mount is this expansive kind of place. In Jesus' day, it had nine very large, expansive gates, massive. The, the one in the front was, was solid brass. It had a dome of gold plate for miles. You could see it reflecting in the sun. It was phenomenal. Josephus, who is a, a Jewish historian, he wrote in his History of the Jewish Wars 
that a lot of these stones that were laid for this temple were 35 feet long, 12 feet thick, and 12 feet wide. So they weighed about 120 tons each. They were cut off site in Solomon's quarries and then brought to the side. It's an amazing story. And if you go to Israel and you take a tour of the uh, below ground, if you will, uh, where the, um, the gates and where the fence of the old city is, you can see these blocks one upon another with literally, you know, inch together. They're just phenomenally big and impressive to be sure. And so I don't doubt that, you know, the disciples were pretty proud of the thing. Look at how beautiful this is. And, and to hear how it was moved by slaves and, and, and you know, transported so heavily up the hill and all, it's, a, it's an amazing feat. If they hope to encourage Jesus' spirits, maybe raise his spirits, what he said must have discouraged them completely. Because though the Lord had wept over the city that past Sunday, now he begins to talk about the destruction of their place of worship. And he almost uses similar words. It, it left the disciples silent. And they walked the, the, the mile, however long that might have taken, with troubled hearts, nonetheless. Now, Jesus' words would come to pass, reliably so, in 70 AD, when the Romans had been struggling with the Zealots. The Zealots were really a bunch of Jews who didn't want to pay taxes. They saw themselves as a you know, above the state. They weren't about to, to work with the Romans. And the Romans finally sent in with, with Titus the 10th legion, and they besieged the city of Jerusalem for quite some time. Uh, on the day that they attacked, Caesar was in the Antonio Fortress, that little portion of the Temple Mount where the Romans kept soldiers just in case there was trouble. And there was always trouble, it would seem, there. And when they decided to send in the soldiers <clears throat> One of the specific orders that Caesar gave was to spare the temple. Don't destroy the temple. We want everything in it. And there was a lot of gold in it and those kind of things. Um, but the troops went after the Jews. There were many who decided to try to hide themselves in the temple. Uh, they began to shoot flaming arrows through the, through the windows. The place was burned to the ground. Josephus against the Jewish historian and Book six of the history of the Jews wrote that uh, they began to take the thing apart one block at a time to get to the gold that had melted into the cracks. So 37 years down the road from verse six, these things would absolutely take place. But the disciples <laughs> understand, and, and if you've been with us on Sunday, their expectation was we're going to Jerusalem and taking over. There's no first coming, second coming, dying, for our sins, there's just a king coming, and that's us, and we're going to rule and win. And the Lord had been talking to them a lot about the fact that that wasn't so. So they said, verse 7, to him, <clears throat> when they sat down on the other side, Teacher, when will these things be? What will be the signs when these things are going to take place? We read in Matthew 24, or that they sat down with him on the Mount of Olives, and they said to him these, thing, these, these three questions. Tell us when will these things be? What will be the signs of your coming? And what will be the signs of the end of the age? Three questions. If you've been to Israel, the Mount of Olives is about 150 feet only higher than Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. So you get a pretty good view of the, of the Temple Mount area, especially as the sun is setting in that direction. Um, beautiful late in the day where they were sitting. And, and notice that the disciples' question here is tied to what he said as they were leaving, that this temple was going to be destroyed. For the disciples, put yourself in their shoes, the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple would be the end of the age. It would be the establishment of the Messiah's rule. It would mean he would take over, and that, that would be it. And whatever would, would cause that to happen, that would be the end of it. Now, they were not asking about the second coming. 
because they didn't even understand the first coming yet. They were always anticipating when he came, we win, and that was it. But that wasn't the case, and the Lord has been this last year in particular with them stressing the, the fact that he had not come to rule and to reign, but to die and to rise and to, to save. Jesus' answer to them, and these initially down through verse 19, where we're going to go this morning, was that there would be a lengthy time between his first and his second coming. That as the nation of Israel is set aside, whom God had worked through to this point to bring forth the Messiah, God would now establish the church age, the age of the Gentiles, if you will, where people would come in, Jew and Gentile, but they would come in individually. The relationship with God would be an individual one. You get saved individually. But there is coming a day when the Lord will come and take the church out, and God will then turn again to deal with Israel nationally as he had before this time. It is the 70th week of Daniel, if you were with us going through Daniel, or you can go back and listen to it. But look, we're, we're getting close to that time for a couple of new, different reasons. Number one, Israel finds itself in the land again. That only took place in 1948. They had been out of their land for so long. So we find ourselves on the brink of the end of this age, the church age, the age of grace. And with the rapture, the beginning of that last seven-year period of, of God's timetable of dealing with natural Israel will begin. And it will conclude after the great tribulation with the second coming of Jesus to rule and reign over the whole earth and you to rule with him. So there's this prophetic kind of dualism. I think you don't want to forget the context, though, of the question. Jesus is, is speaking to Jews about their Jewish city and their Jewish temple and the Jewish future and the relationship that they would have to the Messiah's rule. And Jesus' first answer is, this is going to take a while. This is not going to be immediate. Jesus, the, the faithful Shepherd speaks with great kindness and love and warning that they should be ready to stand fast and watch closely because two and a half days from now, he was going to die. And six, six, six weeks from now, he was going to rise and disappear. The church would have been born. And the kingdom of, of God would be in the hearts of the believer. But we're still in that period of God's grace. Still in that church age, but from all of the signs of what we see around us, how long, much longer can it be? So his first answer, as they asked him about these things, was verse 8, Take heed that you are not deceived, for many will come in my name, and they'll say, I am he. The time is drawn near. Therefore, do not go after them. Again, the whole lesson is time. During that time that the Lord is gone, be careful of the deceivers. Take heed. It's a word that means to pay attention or to be careful or don't immediately react when someone shows up and goes, I'm the Lord, let's go. The time is up. I'm the one. He's not the one. The end might be near, but it isn't near enough to follow them. In fact, for the, for the saints... The Lord is coming to gather us together to himself. When Paul met with the Ephesian elders, he was on his way back to Jerusalem where he would be arrested and those years of imprisonment would begin. Paul said to these elders that he had spent three years with but hadn't seen for a while, look, I want to make sure that you understand that when I leave, grievous wolves are going to come in from among you and they won't spare the flock. And they will be men like yourselves. They will speak perverse things. They will seek to draw disciples after them. Watch out. In tears, I warned you for the last three years, be careful, because that's just the way the, the attacks come from the enemy against God's people, if you will. And so be careful and be ready. <laughs> you know, often God warns us about the false messiahs, the, the satanic counterfeits that claim to be God's messengers, or, or even worse, they claim to be God themselves. Jesus tells us here that the age that we are in between his first coming and the second would be filled not only with a lot of interim time and extended time, if you will, 
but that it would be filled with those who would pretend to be him. The Jim Joneses of the world or the David Koreshes of the world and so many others. He's giving them a counsel. Be careful as you wait. Watch. Be on alert. Paul would write to the Corinthians in chapter 11, be careful that they come to you preaching another Jesus whom we haven't preached to you or a different spirit which you haven't received or a different gospel that, that you haven't accepted and you would <laughs> do well to kind of put up with it. Be careful. Don't buy into these lies. Same chapter, 10 verses later, he said, you know, the false prophets, the false apostles, the deceitful workers, they will transform themselves into the apostles of Christ. And it's no wonder even Satan can transfer himself into an angel of light. Be careful. Church is always to be on guard. We know it. we're looking for Jesus, not some phony who thinks he's Jesus. In fact, when Jesus comes for us, We'll see, we'll be gathered together in the clouds. We'll hear the trumpet. And when he returns for his second coming, the Bible says, every eye will see him. They'll look upon him whom they've pierced. But for you and I, we'll be out of here in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. But between now and the coming of Jesus, however, um, we need to be careful. Once the church is taken away, Israel needs to be careful because when you get to the great tribulation, you will find them selling out wholesale to the Antichrist who says to them, I'm God, follow me. And it will then find its full fulfillment, if you will. But this is, this is not a sign. This is a warning. There's no sign here, just a warning. He goes on in verse 9 and he says this to them. When you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified. For these things must also come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. And he said to them, nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There's a long enough period of time between his first and com second coming that there will be world wars and rumors of them. Don't be terrified. Don't think, you know, you're lost or God has forgotten about you. This is all part of the waiting experience. And the end is not yet. Now, this isn't, this isn't another specific sign. This is more the same warning to wait, to know the times, and to wait some more. Trusting that the Lord means what he says. Historically, we have had 13 years of war in the world for every one war, year of peace. Until the last century, we've now had two world wars, and if we go the way we're headed, we might get to World War III before the Lord comes. Yet with every war and rumor of it, there are always prophets coming out of the woodwork. Oh, this is the end! Well, maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. But I'm not going to live any differently. I'm looking for Jesus in peace. I'm looking for Jesus in war. Lord, come. That's where I should be. But to these men, whose, whose anticipation, their goal, I'm sure they went out and bought clothes already for the big takeover, you know? <laughs> they didn't get it yet. Every rumor of war brings out the prophets. You should have seen our attendance skyrocket here after 9-11. It lasted for a few weeks. Oh, I think we got it. All right, it's not the end. I guess we'll go back to it. Gulf War brought some folks in for a while then back to normal, if you will. Verse 11 says, there was going to be great earthquakes in various places and famine and pestilence, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from the heavens. Even the natural disasters will continue between the time that the Lord has left and the Lord returns. Earthquakes, famine, the word for pestilence, by the way, pestil, is the Greek word for virus. So whether it's AIDS or Ebola or this COVID deal, nation will rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Mark records Jesus saying, this will be the beginning of sorrows. This isn't the end either. It's just, it's a, it's a description of the times in 
between, if you will. The difficulty that will be faced by God's people and by, uh, by the Jews as well, if you will. Unprecedented. But if you look to the book of Revelation, during the time of Revelation, those things will be unprecedented and catastrophic. It is, it is a near term and a far term, if you will, look. And if you've read the book of Revelation, you've read about the earthquakes that will tip the earth off of its axis. I'm glad we'll be in heaven then, on solid ground. Even before 70 AD, Laodicea was leveled by an earthquake. There was a killer famine in Rome. Mount Vesuvius had buried Pompeii. There were plenty of signs, if you will. Today, 9 million people a year die of malnutrition. We've experienced the virus-driven illnesses. No matter what side you take on it, it's, it's not good. But if you compare that to the seal and trumpet and bull judgments of Revelation 6, 8, 11, 16, this is nothing. There is a precursor. There is a taste and see. But before that day of the Lord's return, these will ultimately broadcast that we are near to his second coming. All of these things to say, be patient. It's going to take a while. The words, the fearful signs and, or sights and great signs in heaven are probably best applied to, the again, the book of Revelation with the odd things that you see there that really aren't part of our natural experience. And so there are some things that haven't fulfilled themselves. Um, but there are some odd things. You know, we've, we, you know there was a, a, a comet in the year before Jesus was born. According to history, there was that Haley Bop thing that the, wasn't that Heaven's Gate cult people in San Diego decided they'd all kill themselves. I think there were how many, 39 of them, just to join the comet. Crazy stuff. Beginning of sorrows. The message, wait, time is passing. It's going to be a while. Well, it's been a while. It's been a couple of thousand years. Or to the Lord, it's been two days. Verse 12. But before all of these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you and deliver you up to the synagogues and to the prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Before all of these other even beginnings of signs, in terms of their long-term future application, here's a very shorter-term application. You're going to suffer for your faith. As you wait for the Lord, the world is not going to be a welcoming place. For the church, it isn't a place to just ah, find comfort in. We are sent, if you will, as, as sheep among the wolves. And the Lord has told us that it is going to be a difficult time as we wait for him to return. <clears throat> the book of Acts <clears throat> certainly, sorry, certainly <clears throat> bears out the suffering of the early church, suffering at the hand of the Jews, the synagogues, suffering at the hand of the Gentiles, the, the kings and the governors who imprisoned both, suffering for my name's sake, Religious and political persecution for having faith in Christ. It's always been an issue. Jesus said you can count on that as you wait. It's a near-term application. Near-term meaning now, not then. Peter and John were arrested by the Sanhedrin. Stephen was killed by them. <clears throat> James was beheaded by Herod. Paul was hunted down in every city, first by the Pharisees. Later on, he was put before Agrippa, and then Festus, and then Fe or Felix first, and then Festus, and then Nero. Millions died in the first 300 years of the church because of the Roman persecution. And Jesus spoke about that even there in, in the Gospel of John. He said, look, if the world hates you, know it hated me first. If you're of the world, the world would love you. Love its own. But because you're not, I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And a servant's not greater than his master. If they love me, they'll love you. If they, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. But they'll do this to you for my name's sake because they haven't known me. But I'm telling you this ahead of time so that you'll know. I'm letting you in before it happens. 
He said to them in John chapter 16, let me tell you this so you don't stumble. They're going to put you out of the synagogue. There's coming a time that people killing you will think they're doing God's service. But it's because they haven't known me or the Father. But I'm telling you this ahead of time. <clears throat> and I'll tell you this, I'll be with you. In other words, life is not going to be so easy for the church. It's going to be a difficult road that we follow. Verse 13 and it will turn out, but it will turn out for you as an occasion to give your testimony. Now, I must tell you, this kind of persecution, it's not the first thing I think about. They're going to put you in jail and beat you for your faith and politically persecute you because you're a Christian. Hey, it'll be a great time to witness. It's usually a great time to complain. But that's not the way the Lord sees it. <clears throat> Today, many are still dying. The church in, in Myanmar, in what used to be Burma, is just ravaged lately by those who want to see it destroyed. In China as well, underground church continues to grow. People continue to die. Many Muslim nations, yet here's how the Lord sees that. Hey, it's a great testimony that you're living for Christ. The, the death of Stephen was the seed of salvation for Paul. It would come back to haunt him. The word martyr in Greek, martyrs, means witness. It means that you are a witness for the Lord. When, when the disciples were beaten and told not to preach anymore, it says in, in, in Acts chapter 5 that they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Testimony. The church under pressure can be a great witness under that pressure. Don't always get out of it. Sometimes you just have to shine through it. The Lord's warning to his own that he loved, the four of the apostles who sat with him that Tuesday night. What a refreshing way to look at trials. <laughs> the gospel is to be taken to all, but sometimes at great cost. We have some friends who are ministering in Sudan. And in order to get to the Sudan from the borders of Kenya, you have to go across about 80 miles of, of absolutely unregulated ground. This last year, they lost three pastors just driving from one place to the other. It is, it is a hard place to be. Your great challenge, are you going to come to church in the rain? <laughs> but imagine if this is your calling. The church is not, doesn't have an easy time. It isn't supposed to be easy. It's not, it's not designed to be such in the world. But again, we know that the world will eventually fully be evangelized, uh, Revelation chapter 14, during the Great Tribulation. People say, well, we've got to reach the whole world, and then the Lord will come. No, we'll, we'll not be able to do any such thing. But if you read Revelation chapter 14, you'll read about an angel who flies through heaven with the everlasting gospel, preaching the gospel to every tongue and nation and tribe and people upon the earth. But that doesn't mean we stop. We continue to reach out. So for now it is suffering, but we can rest because according to verse 13, we can have a great testimony. In fact, verse 14, <clears throat> Therefore you should settle in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer, I'll give you a mouth and wisdom which you, your adversaries will not be able to contradict or to, uh, to resist. The Lord's promise is, this is one time you don't have to plan. <laughs> I'll give you what to say when you're there. Since you're, you're there as a witness, I'll make sure that the Holy Spirit who dwells in you will speak. So don't plan ahead what you're going to say. Just let the Lord speak to you and through you that day. This is not a promise to lazy pastors. Well, I don't plan. But it is a promise to the would-be martyrs for his glory. Peter, with um, in Acts chapter 4, had ministered to that fellow there in the temple, with, and because he was now walking and stood next to him, it says they could say nothing against him. When St Stephen... Um, in chapter 6, stood up and began to speak for Christ. 
it says in verse 10 that they were not able to resist the wisdom of the Holy Spirit who spoke through him. So God will enable you, but life is not going to be easy. And if you're going to be a witness in this world, especially the, the closer we get to the, to the Lord's coming for the church, the end of the age, the harder that's going to get. In fact, verse 16, the Lord says, you'll be betrayed by your parents and by your brothers, by your relatives and by your friends. And some of you, they're going to be put to death. You'll be hated by all for my name's sake. When hatred for Jesus overcomes blood ties and friendship ties, that's a spiritual issue, isn't it? It happened in Nazi Germany. Many families turned in other family members as collaborators. It's certainly happening during the Great Tribulation. But Jesus isn't painting a rosy picture here of waiting. There's no follow me and the less will be easy. I got saved and life's been great. In fact, following the Lord would be much harder than you would suspect in this world. Some would be put to death for their love for Jesus. And the question often becomes from church people, why does the Lord allow us to suffer? Why doesn't he answer our prayers quicker? Why didn't why he deliver me? And the answer, at least in part, is found in verse 13. God wants to use you so that through you he might make known to the world that God is for real and that he can keep his own. We were given an occasion to be a witness. When Esther was encouraged by her uncle Mordecai to go talk to the king because the plot was in to kill the Jews wholesale, she said to Mordecai there in, in Esther, I think it's chapter 4, you know the rules. If you go before the king and you weren't invited, you get put to death. And to be honest with you, he hasn't asked me to come talk to him in a month. And Mordecai says, do you really think if you don't go talk to him that you're going to be able to escape along with the rest of the Jews? If you are quiet now, God will bring deliverance to us from another means. But who knows? Maybe you were meant for such a time as this. And as a result, she went in and God used her. And the plot for Haman was, was nixed, if you will. So, no divine immunity for suffering, but a glorious promise of a life and a testimony that God's glory will come through your life. And his assurance, that he'll tell you what to say. He'll keep you. In fact, notice these last couple of verses. It says, not a hair of your head will be lost, so by patience possess your souls. Now, you might read, some of you are going to be put to death, and you read, not a hair of your head would be lost. And you go, wait a minute. There is a problem there. <laughs> I'm dead, so is my hair. I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> Suffering will certainly be a part of our lot. However, God will watch over us. In fact, nothing can happen to you that he doesn't allow. He watches over. He knows the very number of your, ha your hairs on your head. And for me, that isn't, he doesn't need an angel to help him anymore. <laughs> Just one single number, it's fine. So verse 19, hang in there until I come. Things are not out of control. God knows the time better than we occupy until he comes, because that's really God's calling to us. Now, I don't know how this went over with the boys. It doesn't sound promising. <laughs> it's only going to get worse. But at the same time, as he continues to speak to them, he'll, he'll now speak to them about the destruction of Jerusalem and then the return of the Lord and what God will do with the nation as a whole in the days to come, but we'll do that in the next week or two. Father, thank you this morning for your word to us, how, how important that we grab hold of the fact that the church is not at home here. This isn't our home. This isn't a place that we're going to be settling in. This is a place where we're going to be delivered from. We're in the world, but we're not of it. This is not our citizenship anymore. And so as we wait, Jesus, for you to come and we certainly would love it if you would come this afternoon, this morning, and that the church could be where you are. But your timing is far better than ours. You've warned us about the things that we're going to face, and then you've warned the nation about what they may, as a nation, face when the church age is finished, when the end of this age comes, and those final seven years of Daniel's 70-week 70 70 prophecy will take place. So... May we as a church be willing to, to, to stand for you, suffer if necessary. We, we certainly still live in a country where there's very little persecution for our faith by comparison. 
but maybe it'll get harder. May we resolve today to live for you. You're our Lord. What you've given for us, may we give it all to you, our lives. And if you this morning don't, you know, Jesus as your Lord. Really, <laughs> that's what the church age is all about, the, the gospel of Christ and his invitation to individuals to acknowledge their sin and look to him and his death and his resurrection as a place where God's, God's solution for man's sin was, was, was delivered. His son, born in the flesh, would take our sins and, and bury them at Calvary and rise to give us his spirit new life. If you don't have the Lord Jesus, his death for you would be inconsequential because you didn't receive it. And one day you'll find yourself in judgment rather than in life. The pastors will be up front after the service. We'd love to pray with you to ask Jesus into your heart. If you're online, please follow the, the links in the description box as well. God has life for his people. But waiting for him to come isn't always easy. But we need to be fruitful. Shall we stand?